And we are live. Welcome back to MicroConf On Air. It's been a, been a minute. Every other week on Wednesdays at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific, we live stream for about 30 minutes. We cover topics related to building and growing ambitious SaaS startups that bring us freedom and purpose and allow us to maintain healthy relationships. We're back this week with some new AV equipment. I got a brand new Logitech Brio HD cam. So uh, after the other one was incompatible, my DSLR was incompatible with my new M1 Mac. I hope we're looking loud, live, and independent today. I am the product market misfit, Rob Walling. As always, I'm your host, and it's really, really good to be back in front of you. Thanks for joining us today. I'm going to be talking with uh, my special guest, Marin Kate, today. She's with Avra Talent, and you may remember her from an episode of Startups for the Rest of Us that we recorded, boy, it's got to be close to two years ago now, and it was uh, her story of uh, building Zertual, which was a virtual staffing agency. They had a, a bunch, uh, you know, a, a whole staff of VAs that um, that they were building up. It was a great startup story with a pretty sad ending actually. And then she came, rose like a phoenix out of that to start Avra Talent. And that's what she's been working on for the past three years. She has bootstrapped it for three years and um, actually at this point is, uh, is looking for options to raise some funding now that she's found product market fit. Marin Kate's been in the startup circles for quite a while and um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to talk to her today. We're going to talk about a couple things. One, she's taken this talent agency and tweaked and experimented and worked with the the pricing models and the um, really the business model to find what you know she now feels like is is product market fit in the space. And if you go to Avra Talent dot yeah, it's Avra Talent dot com. You can check out what they do, and they are you know. Uh, uh, a recruiting, they were a recruiting agency, but they they have fast, flexible support for remote friendly companies, and they have uh, they deal with it. She said the top five percent of um, recruiting talent in the in you know kind of in, in the U.S. I guess so. Um, yeah, it's a really interesting story. So there there are questions. If you have any questions about um, you know finding product market fit and and how to think about that, I'm going to start off with some of those topics. And then also Marin in her career has hired hundreds and hundreds of people to this point and now runs a company that is dedicated to that. And so if you have any questions, we'll probably be digging into that uh, in the latter half. But as always, microconfconnect.com. If you want to ask questions, it's in the Microconf on air channel. And with that, let me welcome Marin Kate to the show. How's it going? Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you back. Nice to chat with you again. And um, I think... Looking forward to meeting up at a microconf someday. You were on the docket to speak in Minneapolis in 2020, and um, uh, you know, regrettably, couldn't have that due to COVID. But hope that we're able to meet in person soon. So, yeah, talk us through a little bit. So, you know, I did my best to fumble through a, a description of, of Avra Talent, but could you tell the you know folks listening and watching right now, describe it in, in your own words? Yeah. So we like to think that we're kind of like. Uh, we're offering what AWS does for your servers. We do for like, we call it the talent stack. So when a company, whether it's a small company or a growing company needs to start hiring and they don't have all the resources in house to do that, which very few companies do unless they're truly massive, they'll come to us and we'll connect them. We'll, you know, do an intake call. We'll get an understanding of their needs. We'll connect them with some dedicated uh, recruiting specialists based specifically on what they need to get done, whether it's building out an ATS or hiring, you know, eight engineers over the next quarter. And then we work with them. Um, we bill by the hour, similar to a a fractional CFO firm or top what TopTel does for engineers. And yeah, we're our goal is to be fast, flexible partners for mission driven startups that are looking to hire remote friendly roles. Got it. And you know, when you describe it, I think of it as like a talent agency or, or recruiting agency that I would hire hourly to help me. Three years ago, as you were starting this, how was it different? Like, were you not billing hourly? Was it flat fee? Or how has really has, yep. you know, your product market fit evolved over these three years? Yeah, so after Zertual, um, I did two operations roles and kind of got to dig in a little more on that side. One at a company called Rome, which was a co-living uh, startup 
which was awesome. Got to travel all over the world and see how people worked in different countries and time zones. And then the other was with Calm, um, which is now the massive meditation app and community. So I was there when they were maybe 12 or so people. And one of the things that I realized that I had kind of failed at at Zirtual was really being good at hiring my leadership team and hiring as we scaled out. Um, so it was something I wanted to get better at. And I decided the best way to do that was to kind of create a, a little agency. Um, I knew that I could be helpful specifically with remote hiring since all my companies have been remote first. So I hung out my little consulting shingle, started helping calm out, um, and then you know started taking on some clients from there. And when it was just me or when it was just the first few people, we were doing the basic recruitment placement model, which is you need to hire someone. Um, maybe their base salary is 100 grand. Normally, the placement fee would be anywhere from 18 to 25 percent of that, depending on maybe the difficulty of the role. Yeah. So like an engineer would be 25 percent. Maybe a customer support director would be 18 percent. Um, but that was how the model started out. And the reason I, I fell upon that model is because I looked into what other companies were doing and that's what they were doing. And that seemed to be tried and true. Uh, and that's how we started out three and a half years ago. And what what markers did you see that caused you to think, I, I don't want to do that. I want to change it. I want to try a different model. Yeah, so there's a few things. Um, with the placement fee model, uh, it's very kind of feast or famine. And that's because it makes it difficult to actually understand your unit economics and the underlying uh, business metrics. Because you could get lucky and you could hire someone for a very high salary. You could help a company hire someone for a very high salary in only a few weeks. And then you'll have a very large profit margin on that one hire. But more often than not, it's going to take much longer and very often a company will change their mind. They'll say, hey, I thought I was hiring a VP of customer success, but in, real in reality, I need a director of marketing. Now with traditional recruitment firms and agencies, they will either eat that cost or they'll try to finagle something where like they get paid by the client, but it never feels good. Like even when we were placing candidates that were amazing with our companies, I knew as a founder myself that it never felt great to like cut that big check. So we spent a lot of time over the last two years figuring out what's a model that meshes with one of our core values, which is that of alignment. Like how can we align everyone's interests towards the same thing? And we came up with kind of the, the simple solution of we just charge by the hour. Um, we have five different types of specialists and depending on a company's needs, we'll connect them with the right, uh, right uh, group of those specialists. And on the low end, like the hourly low end, you have a recruiting coordinator, which is like a supercharged admin. They do amazing. They handle a lot of the digital paperwork, so to speak. And then on the high end, maybe you'll have a mach machine learning uh, technical recruiter, and that person will obviously charge uh, the highest fee, and the recruiting coordinator will be lower than that. But instead of it's like it kind of came from that uh, background and delegation I had, and the reason that we started Zirtual back in the day was everyone has something where they're truly expert at. And I think that more people should be spending that time in their zone of genius. and that's what that's how the model evolved for what it is now right okay and so is is billing hourly for these services is that something that other agencies or professional services companies do or was that an, like an innovation in the space so people don't do it in the recruiting space um at all pretty much and i outside of like RPOs, which are very large business outsource processing, usually like, you know, call center somewhere. Uh, but companies like TopTal, companies like Pilot or Air CFO, financial services, other professional services um, would, would bill by the hour. Or you think of your law firm. Um, everybody bills by the hour and there's different rates depending on different experience and seniority. Uh, and that was, we took that model and we said, why can't we apply this with a lot of transparency to 
um, to what we're doing here in the recruiting industry. And ever since we made that shift about a year ago, it's really, you know, it was kind of a scary jump to make, but it's really taken off. And not only that, but we found really tight product market fit with what we're offering right now, but also we're able to model our financials and we've hit consistent profitability over the last 12 months, which has just, you know, become a game changer. Right. Yeah. It reminds me of the, you know, the realty industry, at least in the U S is, you know, you sell a house, it's usually five to 6% and that's usually split between buyer and seller's agent. Mm -hmm. And that never really made sense to me. I don't think it makes sense to a lot of people when most professional services do bill by the hour, CPAs, legal, uh, you know, as you said, um, I, I'm one, and I feel like the real estate industry is that way because otherwise the, I, I, well, a realtors would have to track hours. And then I guess you wouldn't know there could be an open-ended, oh, suddenly I owe you a hundred grand because you spent a bunch of hours, you know, or questioning of hours. I think it eliminates some, um, potential issues there given how many realtors there are. But I'm wondering like for you from a business perspective, the alignment is there, right? The alignment of, hey, you're paying for what you're getting for. And if we hire someone super fast, it's less expensive than a flat fee. And if it takes us mm -hmm. a long time, you, you know, the value is, is there. But from your business perspective, do you make more money or less money charging by the hour rather than a flat fee? So I would say we make less, um, we make less maybe margin, but we make a lot more money because, and, and again, that's hard to even track because sometimes we would have a, with agencies, you'll have a margin of 80%. And then sometimes you'll have a margin of like negative 10%. Right now we have a very specific margin. We know every dollar that we get paid, we know exactly what our top line margin is. We know what we're paying our people. We know what flows into, you know, ops marketing, yada, yada. And it's kind of great because when clients have come back to us and we've said, Hey, we've switched to a new model. They'll be like, Oh, is this going to cost us more? And we're like, normally it's actually going to cost you less. And it's a, it's not something we advertise, but it's a great kind of moment to wow our clients where we're like, you're going to get a ton of work and you know, the, the full service that we give our clients and really feeling like an extension of their internal talent team, but you're actually going to pay less than if you were with um, a placement fee model and it's far faster and less risky than if you're staffing up internally. Right. Have, do you ever have issues with a startup who comes and says, I, w I want to hire you to help me, but I, I'm concerned, like we, we do have $7,000 budgeted for this, for this hiring, you know, to, the cost of hiring. So they basically have a budget in mind that they don't want to exceed. It's not open-ended based yeah. on, Hey, they don't have infinite amount of money. How do you, do you, are you able to work within that? Or how, how do you even think about that? Um, so we did something in the very beginning because the company has been completely bootstrapped to this point. Um, and in the very beginning, I kind of decided that $5,000 was the amount of money that if someone could write a check for $5,000 from their business and be like, mm, okay, whatever, like I'll, I'll try to solve this pain point. If it didn't really matter to them, um, like matter, like it's, you know, life or death, then that usually meant that they had the budget that was needed to actually bring on external help with recruiting. So ever since day one, we've charged a $5,000 retainer. Um, that retainer is held in escrow and applied to the final invoice. That is a really good divining rod of who can afford our services and who maybe should be really doing it themselves. And if someone needs to do it themselves, we always say, hey, we'd love to support you later. We're really, um, we love sharing refer like uh, kind of DIY things. I'll get on the phone with someone and give them like some high level. But I would say we're relatively good about saying, this is probably what this is going to cost. We always do a compensation study at the beginning. And if someone's like, Hey, I need a director of marketing and the comp study comes back as 120 to 140 um, a year. And they're like, but I'm only going to pay 60. We'll say, Hey, you might be able to find that, but that's not where, you know, we want to set you up for success and ourselves up for success. And that's just not where we're not compete, trying to compete on that price. Instead, we're saying, do you want the absolute best person? We can help you find that person. Yeah, and for, for those watching and then listening to this later, qualification, you are doing sales qualification and you're saying if you can't yeah. write a check for five grand as a retainer and if you can't pay what we see as a good solid market salary, 
this is just not a fit for us. And anyone out there yep. running, whether you're running a SaaS app or you know an agency, a productized service or whatever, figure out those qualification uh, uh, requirements in essence, because you want to filter those folks out. And sometimes it's, in your case, Marin, it's um, you should go do this yourself probably. So other times it's, because yep. I used to run uh, Drip, which is an email service provider, and we people come to us and they give them, you don't qualify it. And I'd say MailChimp is a great option for you. They don't do everything we do, but they're a great tool. Go free for 2000, you know, subscribers. We so, do the same um, thing. We do the same thing. It's like, here's some job boards. Here's some blog posts we've written. Like you can yep. do this yourself. Um, it's funny as you know, I've been building tech companies and startups and professional services for the last 15 years. And the lesson I keep learning is every time I go narrow, and I turn people away or say no to things, my businesses begin to take off. And it's so hard to force yourself to say no, especially when you're bootstrapped, turning away money, turning away clients. Every single time I make that choice, I'm like, why didn't I do this sooner? So yeah. It's a scary move. And there's, there's, so there's a book, I'm sure you've read it, it's called Book Yourself Solid. And he has a, con I forget the author, Mike, Michael something, but uh, Velvet Rope, policy is what he, he and he wrote mm. this book like 20 years ago. This is when I was still doing consulting, which is why I read it. And he said, have a velvet rope policy. You're going to turn a lot of people away. Mm. And again, as you know, to your point, as a bootstrap business, it's really hard. And he basically spends a whole chapter to pounding on like, figure out who your best clients are and only, you know, only let them come aboard. I want to switch us up on topic a little bit. And because we have a question from Pablo in the chat. And I want to talk a little bit about um, the actual hiring process. Again, you've hired a bazillion mm -hmm. people. You've been <laughs> running, you know, a, a of different kind with a lot of employees. And so I know that you have uh, just, just years of knowledge on this. So Pablo asks, does publishing a job ad anonymously lower the number of applications? Yeah, absolutely. So it's one of those things where a lot of what you want to do in a job description is you're selling the, uh, the right candidate on why you as the company and what's in it for them. So if you're, you know, if you're competing just on, maybe you can pay a lot and you're a huge company and you're just, like if you're an Ernst & Young and you're just like, we need 500 junior analysts every month starting. We're gonna, they're gonna burn out in a year, but that's our business model. Then maybe you can publish it anonymously. If you're a mission-driven company, if you're a startup, if you're a small business, I would say really lean into telling your story and to getting people emotionally involved um, from day one. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. Something that I always did as, again, you know, a, a bootstrapper looking to hire folks always on a budget, always looking to hire outside of major cities, to be honest. We, I mean, before COVID, yeah. that was our big advantage is that we could hire yep. in lower cost areas, work from anywhere. Um, S something that I really did was wrote the job descriptions almost as um, it was it was almost like a letter for me. I didn't sign it as me, but it was like it would start off and and it would talk about the the prospect themselves of like you're you're an amazing developer. You know, I'd use a lot of you mm -hmm. words, and it's like you're, the world is your oyster. You can work anywhere. Why would you work here? You know, I'd start off almost with a sales job, yeah. a bit, like, a long, like a long form sales letter, but not you know cheesy or whatever. And then I dig into the role, and what I found was that it turned some people away because they would say, well, this isn't as professional as the target job description, you know, for developer job description. But the people who filtered through were really interested in something different that it yep. spoke. They would say some, I literally would get, a, you know, uh, applications from a senior engineer who'd say um, multiple times, uh, I wouldn't have applied, but your your description was so different than everything else. It made me curious, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm, cur I'm curious how your thoughts on that. I mean, you know, you, <clears throat> excuse me, you obviously have to keep professionalism, you know, in mind in terms of um, uh, working with clients and stuff. But do you do you mix in humor? Do you mix in? Um, it depends know, on elements? the company. Yep. So that's the real big part why we always get to know our our clients and their culture because it really depends on the company. If it's a professional services firm, like we've got a few financial services firms, they want to be more buttoned up. That's part of their culture. That's what they're focused on. Then we've got an amazing client called um, How to Cake It. And they are 
a YouTube business, YouTube media driven business that is all creating these amazing pastries and cakes and building community around that. And they have such great personality and that really comes through in their job description. And it, exactly what you said, it attracts the right people. Some of the best job descriptions I've ever seen were written by this one CEO of a company that I think they were doing at least $100 million a year um, in like the health tech space. He would write the job descriptions himself, very similar to what you said. He would say like from the, the desk of, and then he would just go. And they were like so long, but people, the right people were drawn to it. The wrong people were like, I don't want to work for this guy. It sounds like a you know nutcase. But the people that were engaged by it loved it. So especially just considering the amount of noise out there, the more that you can make your post stand out in a way that's authentic to your company, the better. And when you um, post jobs on board on online job boards do you have kind of a one-size-fits-all approach of like we're always going to use indeed and then we're always going to use these five remote job boards or whatever or you know you look at the specifics of of company it depends on the company it depends on the type of role um it depends on the size and stage of the company are they like a venture funded company then angel list is often a really good um place to post are they more of a kind of local vibe, even if it's fully remote, uh, built in, has a variety of job boards built in Austin, built in Brooklyn, built in Salt Lake City, and mm. you post directly on that. Um, there's job boards that are specific to product marketers. There's job boards that are specific to people with disabilities. It really comes down to taking the culture of the company and then taking thinking about what type of person is going to succeed in this role and putting together um, the right job descriptions from that. There's some basics like we always post on remote.co because we do fully remote roles. Um, you know, we'll post on Indeed, we'll post on ZipRecruiter, but usually where we find the most unique inbound candidates is from the small job boards and hmm. the professional communities, like a Facebook group for growth marketers who are into like health tech or something. Right. Yeah, that was my experience as well, or has been my experience. Like uh, we work remotely.com, authenticjobs.com, yep. dynamitejobs.com. Well, there's a fourth one, but they, I haven't written down somewhere. That's what I, even for, for tiny seed as we, we've only hired one person, but um, these are where I find that you, I get a lot lower volume, but a lot higher quality, a lot better signal yep. to noise. When does it make sense? Um, so, okay. So when I, when drip was bootstrapped, we, I would post jobs, we get incoming resumes, I'd filter through them, I'd do the whole process, we'd hire someone. We got acquired, we sold to Lead Pages in 2016, and it was a company with $38 million in venture capital, staff of 170, an entire recruiting team that I, that I was then able to work with and hand a lot of this off, um, except for final decision making. They did a lot of outbound, they did all the posting and all the filtering, but then they would go on LinkedIn and they would outreach directly mm -hmm. to developers and, and folks. Um, when does that make sense in your opinion? Because it's something I have ne I had never done and haven't done it since. I mean, we we did it. I was there for about twenty months after the acquisition, and it seemed to work relatively well. But I'm guessing there are times when that makes sense to do. Certainly, if you're hiring like C level candidates, there are only you know hundreds of those in in the world perhaps that are really qualified for a SaaS C level job at a venture funded company, right? So there are only your pool is so small, and people aren't aren't actually looking for the job, so you have to go direct. But Aside from maybe that use case, like when, when does it make sense to do more outbound stuff? I always think it makes sense to do both um, as early as you can. If you've got the bandwidth or the time, um, you're either going to invest time into it or you're going to invest money. So you're either going to hire someone like us or you're going to be like, I'm going to carve out four hours of my day and maybe I'll also um, bring on an EA in the Philippines to help me with, uh, you know, finding the, the like uh, searching for, for profiles. Um, but I really do think for most roles outside of very junior roles, it's great to get a combination of both outbound and inbound. Um, we notice especially for roles that have taken off in the broader, you know, product managers is a good example. 10 years ago, no one even knew what a product manager is. Now everyone from Walmart to, you know, the hot new startup are hiring product managers. So you're going to get a lot more noise coming in an inbound funnel, no matter where you post, you really do need to also balance that with outbound. The cool thing for bootstrapped or small companies is, is you'll never ever get better 
response rates than when you reach out to someone as the actual founder. Um, yep. Whenever that's possible, it's just huge. But at the same time, if you know you're a company of 150 and you need to hire 10 engineers this quarter or something, you can scale up outbound. Um, it just take it's a numbers game. And then the other aspect of it is at the same time, it's also an authenticity game. You really have to trust your recruiters or trust your recruiting partner to not only be able to um, authentically represent your brand, but not to be that spammy, you know, high insert name, comma, blank, 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 to actually take the time and effort to say, hey, this person might potentially be interested in this role. They may not, but just wanted to float it out there. Um, that tends to get the best response from outbound versus the equivalent of like cold sales emails, which everyone deletes. And right. it's like that that works less and less nowadays. Right. We have a question from the chat you know, around average talent and the, the services you provide. Question is, do you do the interviews as well or as or are those left to the client? We do. For most of our clients, we do full service. Um, it just depends on their needs. But most of our clients, the goal is we take about 80 percent of the recruiting off their plate. So they are they are only interacting with the, you know, top, let's call it seven to 10 candidates who have already passed technical or, you know, basic uh, tests that are a culture fit, that have engaged, that have show, you know, that we've checked um, their background and things like that. So the big, the big lift we give is we're like, hey, we're going to take 80% off your plate and then you're gonna run the top candidates through your internal process. And that also saves a lot of time for your existing team because that's one of the biggest bottlenecks is if you're hiring, you know, salespeople and then you're like, hey, my already super busy salespeople, can you carve out a few hours each week to interview these other salespeople? It just makes it, it causes a lot of friction. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, if I were to hire, you know, average talent to help us hire, that's, I would basically want the top three candidates, maybe five tops. So mm -hmm. I would want all the filtering done of resumes. I would yep. want all the initial phone screens, um, you know, and, and then everything else. That's how we worked again at Drip with. And I, I struggled a bit because I had worked with recruiters 15 years ago and didn't like them. They were, it was just crappy sales people. You know, it just, it, I was kind of burned on the, on the, on the model, mm -hmm. but getting a drip, um, once we had people on staff who really, really cared and the, the incentives were aligned because they were my coworker trying to fill roles that people they were going to work yeah. with, all the incentives made sense. And they weren't on the clock of like, got to go faster. They were like, we're going to find the right person. I'm not going to, I'm not going to mm -hmm. badger you into hiring someone that's not a fit. Right. Which is what I dealt with 15 years ago. Once that happened, I realized, oh, I'm never going back. Like I, these mm -hmm. days I won't if we posted a job. I'm going to hire some help because the amount of time that I used to spend, posting to Indeed and the other four or five job boards and then managing the inbound and that, you know, and it just doesn't make sense. Is that my core competency? Is that my zone of genius? No, it's not, mm -hmm. you know, but maybe, maybe in the final um, pickup is one. Uh, there's a follow-up question. Have you thought of standardizing on interviews so that one candidate doesn't have to re-interview for a second company? That's yeah, that's actually something that we would love to build. It's kind of on the product roadmap towards end of this year, beginning of next. Um, we're going to be hiring a product manager and, you know, like our first engineer. I think there's a huge opportunity um, for that. And there's also just a lot of burnout from great candidates applying over and over and over to a variety of jobs, mm -hmm. never hearing back. There's just so much optimization that can be done that there. And so I absolutely like the big the big vision that is very much something that I, I think is could be a game changer in both the hiring and getting hired. Yep, I'm right. I'm watching producer Xander type into my, it's like a reverse headhunter situation. Yeah, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of like making it a lot easier on folks, right? On, uh, on potential candidates yep. such that they can do it once and get qualified, a little more of a marketplace. Very cool. Well, this, yeah, this has been fun. So folks want to keep up with you. You are Marin, Kate, M-A-R-E-N, K-A-T-E on Twitter. And it looks like you have a Substack. How are you? How long have you been doing Substack? Are you enjoying it? Uh, yeah. I mean, I've been writing a newsletter for like 
over a decade. Um, and I switched to Substack. I don't ever plan on charging or anything, but I actually just like the simplicity. I just love like <laughs> it was easier than using MailChimp. And I was like, hey, this makes it easier. I'm more likely to publish. And I just right. kind of document my my startup journey in pretty, you know, pretty transparent ways there. So yeah. Awesome. So that is at, let me see, marinkate.substack.com if you want to uh, follow her entrepreneurial journey. And of course, avratalent, A-V-R-A, talent.com if you want to learn more. Marin, thanks so much for joining me today. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. And thank you to our viewers and listeners for hanging out with us again today. Uh, MicroConf Remote, which happened just about a month ago. You can get still get access to the video recordings at microconfremote.com. Those cost $25 for, I think it's what, four or five hours of tasty startup goodness. Thank you as always to Hay and Stripe for being our headline partners again in 2021. They make everything we do just a little bit easier. And next time I'm speaking with Anders Peterson on learning before building. I'll see you next week.